Hello and welcome to English Literature with Susan. Today I want to talk about the fashion of the 20th century, especially the first or the early decades or the first half of the 20th century, uh, the different trends of fiction, different movements related to the fiction, especially uh, the ones uh, which acted as accelerator as at the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, fiction uh, has three phases at the time. Uh, high modernism through the 1920s, celebrating personal and textual inwardness, complexity and difficulty, the, the early decades. And then we had a reaction towards this modernism, especially in 1930s, 40s and 50s. As, as you can see, the genres propagated at the time with the novelties of realism, moralism and um, kind of documentary docufiction. And finally, we have the period after the collapse of the British Empire in which post-colonial literatures and their different voices, various forms of realism um, are being heard at the time. So uh, we, we can say that uh, the novel in 20th century has, um, or the short story, the, the genre of fiction generally um, has three phases, the modernist phase, the reaction to modernism, and the post-colonial phase. Uh, these are the three main genres of novel at the time. Um, we see as um, as the century goes on, by the end of the century, modernism um, given its way to its place to postmodernism, postcolonialism, because both postmodernism and postcolonialism could include lots of voices um, or lots of formal techniques and structures. Um, they, they can represent something like that. So. Uh, diversity is the code of the day and diverse forms, diverse voices, diverse people, diverse countries, nationalities, cultures, ethnicities, um, uh, as well as literary forms and uh, structures can, can have a place or say in the fiction of the, of the century. Uh, if, if you want to check the characteristics of fiction in the 20th century, the high modernist wrote in a wake of shatter, shattering of confidence in the old certainties about the deity and the Christian faith. The root of these uh, claims goes back to uh, the second half of the 19th century and the advances made uh, in different forms of science like archaeology, uh, and, and like uh, high the higher criticism, criticizing the text of Bible, all of them kind of um, vacant and shattered the roots of uh, the institution of the church in in the society and that's why maybe uh the the, the forms uh through which uh the former kinds of literature were written were no, uh, no more uh, matching the beliefs um of the mo of the modern people the realism um at the victorian age or the 19th century is the realism of the life of the social life of the milieu but the realism the high modernness is the realism of form. So instead of looking outward, they looked inward. And literature is form conscious, self reflexive. So the, the, we have different techniques of narration, different uh, forms of narratives, different um, different characterizations, especially of the narrator, the unreliable narrator, for example. So uh, the the, uh, the realism of the nineteenth century, which was based on um, the strong beliefs of the people is now giving way uh, to the chaotic life of the people. And that chaos of life um, has its representation in the fiction. Uh, and we see the chaos, the, um, the external chaos in the internal chaos, internal form or chaos of these works. Uh, so the view about the person, knowledge, uh, psyche, all of them, it just remember Sigmund Freud's additions to the knowledge of the time or um, Fraser's book on anthropology, materialism, history, the old grand narratives, which had more or less sustained the Western novel through the 19th century is just shattered. So the grand narratives are those isms, um, and those forms of ideologies, which which are accepted by a large group of people. But at the beginning of the 20th century, it seems that people are no more faithful to them, to any types of them, uh, because they, they could see uh, the drawbacks or the problems and issues such ideologies and philosophies would bring forth. And 
They boldly venture into this general shaking of belief in the novel's founding assumptions that the world things selves were knowable, that language was a re um, reliable revelatory instrument. Uh, first of all, world is not know knowable, so you cannot be realistic. And second, language, uh, based on what Ferdinando Sosor has contributed to the idea of language, was no more a meaningful kind of phenomenon. One of the uh, uh, primary or the basis of uh, Sosor's view of language is that meaning is something something related to the usage of, of, of the language. So uh, meaning is artificial, meaning is given, meaning is not within the thing, meaning is not something essential, rather um, it is something arbitrary, it is added to uh, the mentality of the people. So uh, if meaning is so uh, at a greater scale is language, so language is, is no more um, a means of conveying a message because you can never be certain of the idea behind that message or uh, the intentions of the sayer. Uh, that the author's story gave history meaning and moral shape. So um, things become um, personal and individualized. Uh, we, we cannot say that a novel is talking about a historical era or a novel is uh, is not uh, taking size. A novel is mostly based on the personal history of the people rather than the greater academic scholarly history. The narrative should fall into ethically instructive beginnings, middle, middles and endings. Um, this idea is also rejected. So uh, the novels are no more um, linear in their in their narrative, the narratives are jumping, leaping from that from here to there. We have the technique of stream of consciousness, moving from one idea to another. So the linearity of the idea of novel that it should have a beginning, a middle, and end is kind of rejected. And many open-ending novels are written, or many novels in which, like the Sound of Fury, in which the beginning um, is not only blurring. Uh, the mind of the audience, but also the, the latter parts of the novel um, contribute to that sense of confusion beginning um, with the starting point of the novel. Trying to be true to the new skepticisms and hesitations. So novel is somehow reflecting the world. The modernists also attempted to construct credible new alternatives to the old belief systems by writing new novels. And this painting uh, shows maybe the condition of modernism uh, by Sonia Delany. Uh, this technique is called Orphism, and there are, like, like what you can see in this picture, there is a sense of abstraction. So the painting is an abstract one, and you can see um, many circles. Uh, this is also another technique uh, used by this artist. Um, maybe uh, one of the most important uh, uh, figures in the fiction of the 20th century in England is Virginia Woolf. Uh, she has written many famous novels like Mrs. Dalloway uh, and, and uh, uh, To the Lighthouse and many short stories and short story collections. Uh, Virginia Woolf is also a theorizer of the novel at the time. For Woolf, as for other modernists, what was knowable and thus representable was not out there as some given fixed transcribable essence. Reality existed rather only as it was perceived by the uh, by the person. So as I told you, in the modernist fiction, at the beginning of the 20th century, everything is going inward. Unlike what was on in the 19th century, what was fashionable at the time, which the novel looked outwardly, here uh, the, the orientation, uh, the tonalization of the looking or the, the perspective of the author is internal. So the author looks into his or her heart or mind. Hence the introduction of the impressionistic, flawed, even if what, what is what is perceived by the author, flawed, even utterly unreliable narrator. Uh, so we don't we, we don't um, have um, omniscient or all-knowing narrators anymore. The narrators are unreliable, so uh, we cannot rely on what they say. A substitute for the classic 19th century authoritative narrating voice, which always ascertained us, always assured us that something uh, something is under the control of the author or 
or the omniscient viewpoint narrating the story. That kind of, that, that point of, that pivotal point that uh, certainty is lacking in the 20th century fiction. So everything just once again goes inward. The real was offered us as refracted and reflecting the novel's representative consciousness. So what was real was the novel's representative consciousness, not, not a general way of looking or not a universal one, but a representative consciousness and looking in, looking just into that kind of consciousness. It was like overhearing something um, or eavesdropping to the mind of the character. Look within, Wolf urged the novelist, reality and truth had gone inwards. So this is how reality is treated at the beginning of the 20th century and how, uh, how 20th century novel is realistic in its own sense. Uh, it, it is true to the psyche of humankind with all those issues, with all those uh, minute characteristics. The life that mattered most would now be mental life, therefore. And we owe this to Sigmund Freud and his uh, contributions. Uh, when he talked about the split psyche of humankind, literature also becomes split in, into fragments, into broken images. And so the modernist novel turned resolutely inward, its concern being now within consciousness, a flow of reflections, momentary impressions, disjunctive bits of recall and half memories simultaneously revealing both the past and the way the past is repressed. Uh, this is a kind of a definition for the, uh, for, uh, for the stream of consciousness. And this picture also tries to show what is stream of consciousness. You see, one idea involves another idea and then uh, the circle continues its life. Psychoanalysis partly enabled this concentr concentration to narrate the reality of persons as the life of the mind. And this is uh, this is the main subject of the 20th century novel, you know, especially uh, the early decades and all this complexity and inner tumult, consciousness, unconsciousness, eat libido and so on. And the apparent uh, truth of this inward life were, of course, utterly tricky, scattered. So the result of uh, the combination of or juxtaposition of these ideas, things, feelings, emotions, is uh, the novels becoming tricky, scattered, or seem fragmentary, spotty, now illuminated, now trilled, now quiet, occluded. For Wolf Joyce's Ulysses was a prime expression of this desired impressionistic agenda. Uh, James Joyce's Ulysses, published in 1922, together with T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland, also published in 1922, um, are considered to be the beginning of modernism in English literature. Of course, Ulysses, uh, because of its nudity and uh, some, some uh, sexu overt sexuality represented in some parts of it, was banned in England and uh, it was very published in France but later on um, many years later actually it, um, it could uh, be published in England as well. Uh, this picture can also show what is stream of consciousness. It begins with a human character and then a castle in the air is being built based on the imagination flow of the thought of the character. Uh, the characters um, of the novels written by James Joyce and Wolf are caught then as they are immersed in the so-called stream of consciousness. And in this picture, you can see um, the, uh, the, the, these characters in painting because Picasso and some other cubists and uh, painters at the time could reflect on this idea. We see that the self is not, it, the self, the picture of the self is, is not a normal one. It, it, it is uh, how we look inwardly and how what is inward can be reflected on the outward appearance of the people. So um, the, in, in the characters of the novels are also like these characters distorted um, in sort of called a stream of consciousness and some versions of interior flow of thought becomes the main modernist access to character. So we don't have direct access to character. We don't have full access to the mind of the character, unlike the novel written at the, big, um, at the 19th century. The reader overhears the character speaking, so to, so to say, from within the particular consciousnesses, but not always directly. The modernist feels free also to enter the character's minds to speak as it were on their behalf, the technique known as free indirect style, style indirect lip in French. Uh, in French, uh, free and direct style means that um, the, 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 when, we, when we have a narrator who is not the character, 
But the narrator's point of view is limited to what the character can feel, hear, see. Uh, for example, in the story of Araby in James Joyce's uh, um, short story collection, The Dubliners, um, and we cannot go beyond the point of view of that adolescent boy. Um, though he is not the narrator, but our point of view is also limited. So that, uh, but once again, I emphasize that that all knowingness, that omniscience of the previously um, existing narrators in the novels uh, cannot, can, cannot be found and sought for in modern fiction. Another issue related to um, the fiction of uh, the first two decades of the 20th century is the existential loneliness, especially this is felt after the two world wars. And many of, many of the novels talked about this phenomenon of existentiality. Um, existential loneliness and the idea somehow comes from, from philosophy. And I can refer here to the ideas of uh, the German philosopher Heidegger. Heidegger uh, believed that uh, all of us, what is existence for him? Existence for him begins with, a, uh, with thrownness. He means that by thrownness, he means that we are thrown into life. Life is like a train or like a river. And all of a sudden we have to start our journey in it. Uh, but um, as human beings, uh, as we can uh, shape habits, for example, formulate a life, uh, we, we uh, little by little define ourselves in, in this life. So we are thrown into it. Maybe it was not a, it was not an option. This is the meaning of existence. Uh, uh, according to Heidegger, but but we could we could adapt to its uh, rules, or we can we could define ourselves uh, within the boundaries of this life. But the problem then was uh, this: these things becoming habits or becoming routines, and then we were immersed in routines in a way that uh, our existence becomes something meaningless. And what gives uh, back meaning to this kind of existence is death, according to Heidegger or the thinking of death when you remember that you don't have time or our, um, your time is limited, you, you try something for your existence. So unlike many ideas which consider existential loneliness um, uh, um, you know, as a, as a um, corollary or as a word alternatively used with nihilism, they are wrong. Existential philosophy and existential literature uh, debase existence, uh, though this existence might not, might not be a meaningful one, it's somehow absurd. And the absurd literature is also related to this kind of existentiality or um, the, the selfhood um, as it is uh, lost or as its journey is not a meaningful journey. So it's about the condition of existence rather than the condition of death. Just whenever you mm, forget what existentialism is about, remember the, the word itself, existentialism. So it's a philosophy, of, a kind of philosophy of existence. Um, another technical, um, you know, issue related to the fiction of the 20th century is what, what was used by James Joyce. James Joyce adapted mythology into his own times, and he tried to give an interpretation of what, of what was on in his own life in Dublin or the people's life at the beginning of the 20th century by referring back to famous mythology. This is this technique is called mythic or mythical method by uh, T.S. Eliot when he reviewed James Joyce's Ulysses, but T.S. Eliot himself had also made use of such a technique in uh, great poems such as Wasteland. Novelists built modern myth on the dry bones of the old Christian bonds or um, uh, other forms of mythology. In this review, of, in his review of Ulysses, uh, um, entitled Ulysses Order Myth, T.S. Eliot famously praised the novel for replacing the old narrative method by a new meth uh, methodized as a modern Ulysses, uh, sorry, mythical method. Joyce's Irish Jew Bloom is mythicized as a modern Ulysses, his day's odyssey often ironically reviving um, episodes in Homer's odyssey. The, the chapters are called um, by, by titles taken from Homer's odyssey, but to the contrary of Homer's odyssey, 
Odyssey, um, th this character doesn't travel around the world. Um, Odysseus, the main character of um, Odyssey, uh, had traveled um, around the known world of his time, so he had traveled everywhere. But Leopold Bloom in this novel had also had only traveled across the streets of Dublin, so um, his um, his world is limited to compared with uh, the world of Odysseus. And also, um, um, Odysseus' uh, journey took uh, 10 years, but uh, the, the journey of Lopat Bloom took only one day, so it shows uh, the, the shortness um, of the modern life and the speed uh, we perceive it. With and um, uh, so so the scope of Odyssey is the whole world. By the scope of the Ulysses by Joyce is just Dublin, and uh, the the um, temporality of Odyssey is much 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 longer than uh, what is represented in the Ulysses. This manipulation of a continuous parallel between contemporaneity and antiquity was earlier thought a step toward making the modern world possible for art. And one point here is um, that unlike Odysseus, who was a hero, or he has some uh, a, the series of characteristics associated with the epic hero, uh, Lopal Bloom uh, does not bear them. He is a very ordinary man, and they say that some critics say that they, because uh, the Ulysses is written in a stream of consciousness and it uses mythology, it is very difficult to be read. So um, they say that a person like Lopal Bloom can never read and understand a novel like Ulysses, which is written about him. This is read a quotation from Ulysses, think you're escaping and run into yourself. So th that story of uh, looking inward is also repeated here. Longest way round is the shortest way home. And here uh, you, you can see how in the uh, novel Ulysses, uh, James Joyce has mapped out Dublin, how he has given us a map of the streets of Dublin and, Dublin and its locations. And it is important because um, anyway, uh, the people in Ireland, especially in Dublin, were fighting against uh, the rule of the Great Britain. And at that time, uh, James Joyce wrote his Ulysses emphasizing the locations the locality, if the placehood, let's say, of um, his own country, um, especially the city Dublin. James Joyce uh, left Dublin as a young at a young age, and he never uh, actually returned to his country Ireland. But uh, the only thing he has written about is Ireland, especially Dublin, Dubliners, Ulysses, Portrait, all of them happen, and Finnegan's Wake, all of them happen in Dublin. Uh, and the, for him, Dublin is the microcosm of the whole world. And here we can see a comparison between Homer's Odyssey and Joyce's Ulysses. Um, Homer's Odyssey is a great soldier. Odysseus is a great soldier um, returning from the Trojan War, maybe uh, the greatest war in the world of mythology. Bizarre, perilous events and encounters happen to him. While in James Joyce's Ulysses, Lopa Bloom is a middle aged advertising canvasser. He doesn't have an important job and he goes out one morning, leaving his wife in bed and wanders around Dublin. Uh, and he has many thoughts about his wife and her relationships. And finally, uh, let's talk about the post-colonial fiction uh, and that decolonization phase. Maybe the first novel or the first important novel written in this phase is Chinua Achibi's Things Fall Apart. A major phase in a huge geographic shift in the center of gravity of English language fiction occurred during the post-war decolonization of much of South Asia, Africa, and the Caribbean when Chinua Achibi's Things Fall Apart was published just two years before Nigerian independence. Returning the story of colonial in uh, inclusion from an indigenous viewpoint, and this is important, we have the point of view of the indigenous people. Achibi's influential novel intricately represents an African community before and after the arrival of whites 
and a language and so we can see the tribal life of them and a language made up of english and igbo words uh, so you see how they are using english to represent themselves encompassed by narrative that enmeshes african proverbs and oral tales with english realism and modern reflexivity so it seems that he takes the form from uh, the english uh, cultural trends while the content comes from the africa which was colonized by different european countries and um Mira Chibi was living under the rule of uh, Great Britain. Uh, and there is an anecdote about things fall apart. You know, Achibe says uh, that I had written this novel and there was only one manuscript uh, written. So I asked a typing company on those days, people didn't have typing machines necessarily. So he asked his novel to be typed and uh, the company didn't return him, though he, he was paying for it, but they never and he, then he uh, traveled to Nigeria. So they were supposed to post uh, or mail uh, the novel, but they never did so. And she knew Achibe thought that the novel is now fallen apart uh, or lost. Uh, but um, an English writer and a journalist helped her, helped him uh, to uh, to return the book, and then it was published. And uh, one point about the. Uh, title of the work Things Fall Apart comes from um, the, the poem written by uh, the Irish poet W.B. Yeats, The Second Coming, Things Fall Apart, The Center Cannot Hold, Mere Anarchist Loosed Upon the World. So um, part of those lines from uh, Yeats' Second Coming is taken here to be the title of the novel. And if you're interested in reading The Second Coming, you can check my video um, explaining this poem. Thank you very much for listening and I hope I have explained things in a clarified manner and um, see you later.